Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I speak Russian, but I don't know the Russian language very much, so I'll have to present the uh, Right. So, what are we going to try to do is to explain ongoing work that can progress on uh, where five features so number of gender animacy uh, that come from uh, in Sintra. So do they uh, are they introduced from the lexicon? Are they somehow generated during the syntactic process? Is this uh, a process that involves both of these potential sources and so on and so forth? And so what I'm going to try to uh, I'm not going to try to be very formal about this, but I, where I'm going with this, at least where I think the data may be asked, is uh, towards the distributed morphology approach, where um, uh, the syntactic structure, even of individual words and multiple items, is not is generated in syntax. So there's only one generative mechanism that's called syntax. <coughs> there's no uh, formal features in the lexicon. Uh, so what I will be concerned with uh, today is primarily gender, a little bit of animus, a little bit of a number, and I'm going to be mostly concentrating on Russian. Um, and uh, the starting point is when you look at uh, an extended MP, you see all those five, and you ask yourself where do they come from. One of the reasons why you want to know where they come from is for purposes of agreement. So if you are um, uh, a Chomsky and uh, what's called minimalist and I am, uh, one of the things that you ask yourself is what, what, by what mechanism uh, do uh, different elements agree? Then you have a theoretical approach that says that you need a certain structural configuration for agreement. Now, of course, if you need a certain structural configuration for agreement, then it matters very much where the five features that you agree with. When you look at uh, the internal agreement, one of the things that you discover is that um, the normal mechanism that is assumed for agreement, the syntactic mechanism of agreement, just doesn't seem to predict what is actually observed. So before even trying to figure out what the mechanism is, um, one of the things you want to do is to try to determine what is actually going on. So what are the facts that one is trying to account for? So if you look at gender or the animacy, it is generally assumed that these are introduced by the head noun, by the noun itself, or people sometimes uh, add some functional projection and they say, okay, animacy and gender are introduced in uh, gender P. And uh, there's this uh, nominalizing functional projection called little m, and you can sometimes say that gender is introduced in little m. Um, and number is usually uh, determined by the presence of noun P. But person is clearly much higher, and definiteness is also clearly much higher, so you seem to have all those different five features distributed within an MP, and they all can trigger agreements on an attributive adjective, which is kind of problematic for the normal mechanism of agreement people assume in uh, the traditional right now. And yet the actual picture is somewhat more complicated because for gender, it, is, it can be very clearly shown, this, uh, this phenomenon called mixed agreement, it can be very clearly shown that gender can come into the derivation much higher in the MP. Uh, likewise, when you look at number, it can be the other way around. So even though normally sort of assume number is introduced somewhere in the middle, like not on the noun itself, nevertheless, there are such things as plurality hands and downs where you would probably want to keep that lexicon in some way. So the question arises, do we need two mechanisms of creating five features, one in the lexicon, one in the syntax? As I said, I want to try to argue that there's only one of them, and it's in the syntax. Um, so um, I am going to very briefly mention how uh, Russian five features work. You know this. Uh, Everybody knows this, we all studied this at school, um, with the exception of those of us who studied it at the university. Um, well, for an animate, animate nouns, it's, it's, completely, it's almost completely semantic, except for the declension classes two and three in one terminology, one and three in the other terminology. Uh, basically, uh, the gender classes ending in all and in uh, 
Uh, yeah. Um, nouns denoting human beings, supernatural beings, uh, dolls, and animals are animate, otherwise they are inanimate. That's very simple. The Russian gender system is a mixed one. I will not give you the rules. Again, it's not very relevant right now. But what is interesting is that you can have uh, that these rules can be overwritten, so individual loan words can be specified with a gender that is not semantic in the sense that it does not reflect whether the uh, denotator of the noun in question is an animal uh, or certain male or female, and also it is not um, formal in the sense that it does not reflect the declension class. So one example is that I know of is the word koala, which is in a lot of di in a lot of individual Idiolect is masculine, despite the fact that it's the first declension noun that does not denote a um, uh, necessarily male being. Uh, for plurality, it's uh, obvious, um, except for the exception of uh, plurality times when you have uh, only semantically plural nouns. Um, and in the end, you sort of um, have the following system. You can have, let's, uh, you can have semantics as a source for a five feature. So for instance, gender. Nouns denoting male human beings are male. You can have um, lexical specification, and that comes in two subforms. One is declension class, and that we're very familiar with, for Russian. But then there's also something else which is like looks like featural specification. So that's what I mentioned before, when you have uh, something overriding the default uh, gender specification. So the question is, of course, where, where is the connection between the declension class and the gender established? Um, and now I'm going to present some arguments in favor of saying that even that connection, which is mostly basic, is not established in the lexicon and it's established in the syntax. Um, so the first class of uh, examples showing that this is something that is established in syntax comes from what is known as mixed agreement. If you look at example one on page two, that's the first example. I've been talking for a long time, and that's the first example. Um, you can see that in the, the noun phrase, our doctor, the word doctor is masculine formally, but uh, the adjective is feminine. That's completely OK. It's fine. Um, clearly, it doesn't seem to be the case that the noun doctor comes from the lexicon with two different that the, like there's two nouns, doctor, in the lexicon, one feminine and one masculine. Why not? Well, first of all, it's very uneconomical theory, and secondly, because you can demonstrate that there are some various um, real syntactic constraints on the distribution of this feminine noun. And we'll talk about this a bit later. Okay, and furthermore, if you look at example two, uh, where you have our dentist is very clever, you can see that one adjective agrees with the formal gender and the other adjective word, possessor, agrees with the semantic gender. So it's just impossible to say that in this situation the noun doctor comes from the lexicon with the gender feature. Uh, the second class of cases that show that you need a process of establishing gender, and I'm not just talking about natural gender in syntax, comes from code switching. And uh, when I talk to you, I do. I, I, when, I, when I talk to you today and yesterday, I did that a lot, and I noticed myself that was going on before I heard up on this too. So what happens is, so you use a foreign word. In my case, I can use English in a Russian context, and if it has a, an adjective modifier, then I need to determine some gender. So if I want to say something like, so, um, and it's present in this position, so I would say something like a vetting position, right? Or I can say vetting position. One way or another, I have to establish a gender. And there's been quite a bit of work done on how this actually happens in this online use, right? So in this scenario, it's impossible to say that the lexicon of the matrix language, the language that I'm talking in, has that noun that is borrowed from the other language. However, somehow, that noun is attributed some gender. And there's uh, various ways of doing that. So the most common one is phonology. So it turns out that when you borrow nouns from English into Russian, they mostly become masculine. Why? Because they mostly end in the consonant. 
However, there's also semantic uh, gender assignment. So, for instance, I noticed that today I actually said better position. Okay. Why? Because position is like position or something like this, and I somehow decide that on the basis of some uh, a process called semantic analogy, I attribute to the borrowed noun the gender of some correspondent in the uh, matrix noun. Um, then there's also minor factors, like if you do it, if the experiment is done uh, when it, uh, the nouns are presented written, then the uh, orthography can also matter, and whether there's a cognitive word and stuff like this. But anyway, this is something that happens online, right? So it happens as you speak. And it's uh, something that uh, you just cannot talk about, the, about this being in the lexicon. So clearly, we have a process of formal gender assignment, right? The gender assignment that is not based on natural gender. Uh, and that happens online, so it has to happen in syntax. And many of the same factors determine what happens to loan words. Um, and the third class of cases where you want to have a formal gender assignment in syntax comes from indeclinable proper names in Russian. In general, indeclinable nouns in Russian and indeclinable proper names a very interesting uh, open a very interesting window into what happens with gender in Russian in general, because there you don't have the interference of the declension. And what happens is that indeclinable proper names in Russian are assigned gender by semantic analogy. So you have in three some examples, right? So Belisi is masculine ex instead of the expected neuter because it's a city. And furthermore, um, these data come from um, Rosenthal's um, uh, book on the general status. Uh, I mean, you can see this happening with the normal people as well. Um, you can also see that the same proper name, Somali in form, gets assigned a different gender in function of what is intended. So depending on whether we're talking about a state or a country, you can get that different gender. And you don't want to say that somehow in, uh, in your head, in the lexicon, you have two different Somalis. No, you sort of have one Somali, and you view it under different guises, and depending on how you view it, you assign gender to it. But this is not a lexical process. It has to be a syntactic process. So to summarize what I just shown is, I think that gender assignment has to be available outside of the lexicon. And it's not necessarily, it's not always based just on uh, so it's not always based on natural gender. It's not always based on semantics. Okay? It can also be used on formal criteria such as phonology. So all the factors that are operative in uh, gender assignment, what we usually think of as gender assignment in the lexicon, are also available. Uh, operable, oper <coughs> they also operate in uh, gender assignment in the syntax. So now the question arises: If we have two gender systems, gender assignment systems. Mm -hmm. Do we need the two gender assignment systems? We know from this online data and stuff that we need a syntactic gender assignment system. Do we need a lexical gender assignment system, or can we just uh, use the syntactic gender system for all of this? And I think the answer is yes, but uh, yes. And in fact, um, if there had been two gender systems, then we would have also expected, I think, in at least some languages, two gender paradigms completely different independent gender paradigms, one for lexical gender and the other completely different with completely different agreement markers and stuff like this for syntactic gender assignment. I know, I, I've never heard of anything like this. So again, this work suggests that we have one system and it better be syntactic. So whatever theory of gender assignment we're going to develop, it has to be, I believe it has to be a syntactic gender assignment theory and um, if you subscribe to the principle of distributed morphology, to principles of distributed morphology, then you can actually, there is a way of doing that purely in syntax. Okay? Uh, but I'm, not go I'm just going to sketch now what, what factors have to be taken into consideration for developing the system. Because, okay, the system is kind of easy. What we've been saying for gender assignment in the lexicon, we can also just start saying this for gender assignment in, uh, in syntax, right? So there's the declension class, it matters, there's the 
semantics it matters, there's the natural gender it matters, and we need to figure out how exactly each of these factors matters, but it's except that it's done in the, in the syntax instead of the lexicon. But if gender assignment is syntactic, the question is how can it happen that some nouns get gender that is not predicted by the default assignment systems? So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at uh, how, how to try and formalize the gender assignment system on the one hand and how to try and handle exceptions on the other hand. Okay. Um, so what I want to start with is the hypothesis that the so-called grammatical gender, the formal gender, is actually something that is interpretable. So it's not just a formal syntactic feature that has no semantic value. But instead, it has, it's, it's, an interpretable, it's interpretable, it is interpreted, and it's something about how we classify the world. And this is absolutely not a noble assumption. Uh, people have been saying that for a long time. And maybe it's time uh, we try to listen to them. Okay? Why? Well, because if gender is not interpretable, then it is just a narrow syntactic property. It's just something that exists in syntax. It's not very clear why it has a connection to the real world, but okay. And the distinction between gender and declension classes would be just the difference of declension classes is a feature F that you do not see outside the noun itself, and gender is the feature G that you do see outside the noun itself. Just not interesting. Okay, we have two different classes of formal features, and one is syntactically active, the other is not syntactically active, and there's no reason for having both. Um, if gender had no semantics whatsoever, we wouldn't have expected the gender of inanimate nouns to depend on their semantics. Like those examples that the, um, I mentioned it was in declinables and with uh, uh, loan words, borrowed words. And thirdly, there's this issue of co-variation and phenomenal gender that people have been trying to handle with, by formal means, for instance, by assuming that pronouns are actually now full noun phrases, it's just that you don't have the noun there. Right? So basically, when you say she, it means the woman, or something, or the female. But um, maybe it's, um, it would be nicer to have, uh, if you treat gender as a semantic feature, then you can deal with pronouns with much more ease. So, uh, assuming that, well, we know the semantic gender, what's called known as semantic gender is basically something that classifies individuals by their natural gender. That's the more common, that's the system that we're most familiar with. But actually, there's, I mean, there are other systems where it's not just natural gender, but also things like uh, animate and animate, or uh, I think in some, in some Australian language where there's a gender that denotes non-flesh food. Something that's food, but not flesh, right? So basically, the naturally semantic gender is the classification according to the properties of the individuals. So assume, let's assume that classification by what we know as formal gender is classification by properties of kinds. And why we want that? We want that because this will allow us to handle this semantic analogy gender, mm -hmm. where uh, a noun gets its gender because it's a, it denotes something that is a subkind of something that has that gender. We'll, we'll see such examples. And besides, it sort of it makes sense in, on a number of uh, levels. Um, and then we have then we have. We, we can call two systems. We have the Russian system, which has a declension class, and that functioned as a primarily as a primary uh, uh, I wouldn't say cause indicator of syntactic gender. And then we have languages like French and German, where there's no such thing. So you have something that looks like gender without any any semantic cause to it. Um, but um, so uh, one of the issue, one of the questions that needs to be addressed when when we look at this issue at this at this issue is for Russian, for instance, is what is the connection between gender and the declension class? In the sense that do we say that the declension class always determines gender, or is always a contributing factor to determining gender, or can it also be the other way around? In the sense that can the semantic gender 
the interpretational gender, you know, remember when gender is interpretable, it's a property of a kind, can not determine the differential. Okay? So what I'm going to try to, to talk about is, let's assume two, actually three for Russian semantic features, and let's call them minor or feminine, and marked for masculine, and probably will be inanimate for neuter. This will be the, these will be the gender. Why minor? Well, because cross-linguistically it's very frequent that the feminine gender contains diminutives. Um, and then we have in five a very sketched two classes of rules. One class talks about gender assignment on the basis of the declension class. The other one talks on gender assignment. The other one is a set of rules that determine gender assignment based on the semantics. Right? So if you sort of classify something as minor, then it will be feminine. If you classify something as marked, like for instance, animate nouns are marked, then they will become masculine. Right? Of course, these, these two sets of rules interact. The question is how. Um, uh, before we do that, before we turn to that, I, can, I want to uh, very briefly discuss number. Because number allows uh, but that number can uh, also can also be fitted into the system because, as we know, uh, while there is normal uh, plural determined by semantics, there's also the plural of tantum nouns, where um, while we do have a very strong intuition that there's some plural semantics there, the denotation of such plural of tantum nouns does not necessarily contain plural individuals, um, and. So this is one part, right? So there's this, the same uh, scenario happening. You have normal plural denotation, and then you have somehow plurality is involved, but not at the individual level. And then you have the other um, uh, reason for why it might be interesting to link us to plus two gender is cross linguistically, it's very common that gender distinctions are neutralized in the plural. So in a way, we have a very, very similar system where we can say, okay, there's the plural declension class, right? Uh, and that will be the plurality of the gender. And um, we, have, we can put the nouns into the plural declension class on the basis of the semantics when, when we're dealing with plural individuals. Or again, uh, we can um, simplify, right? So this is, uh, this is what, I, what I just said, is so um, but on the other hand, you can do it, do it in a different way. You can say that the plural attempt of nouns have the plural specification as something that is a property of that kind. Okay, so it's a semantic uh, specification of those nouns. And that's why they behave as plurals, and that's why they fit into that declension class. Okay. Uh, I think the second hypothesis is probably preferable. Um, I'll skip the discussion of animacy. So there's not very much there. Uh, beyond saying uh, one thing, there's semantic animacy. This animacy is always based on semantics, but it can be conditioned by the declension class. So, uh, so you can say, okay, this is just a lexical semantic feature. However, there's also for animacy, you can demonstrate that animacy can change in the course of the syntactic derivation. And these are the examples in uh, 9 coming from YouTube, uh, where when you have a cardinal containing NB uh, denoting something of a measure, something to measure, and it can behave like a, as if it is an animacy. Okay? So once again, this feature, which looked to be a lexical semantic, can be syntactically operative, can change in the course of syntax. Uh, we see that, what I'm trying to say, for all of these five features, you can demonstrate that they don't come from one source, and they, I think they're actually available to this uh, analysis. And um, once again, the phenomenon of mixed agreement shows the same thing for um, here. So in 10, <coughs> There are some examples of mixed agreement. Why are they interesting? They're interesting because they show mixed agreement on the level of the predicate, A versus B. 
we're on the level of uh, 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 entry-train lane, that's A, B versus C, D. And not all options are allowed. It's constrained to get syntactic Um OK. The relevant, uh, the part that is relevant for us is in 13, where uh, it has been argued, shown, you see, that different classes of adjectives behave differently with respect to these degrees. Uh, so, the adjectives that are called reference modifying, syncategorimatic, who are not intersecting, basically those adjectives that do not uh, denote sets in the formal semantic terms, those adjectives do not allow uh, agreement by the semantic gender of the reference. So, if you have uh, Zubna Kraj, whether she's female or male is not the Zubnaya Raj. Okay? So, it's clearly something about uh, individuals and not about kinds. Right? So, when we have an adjective that modifies kinds, high level McNally and Valeria have argued very convincingly uh, uh, that uh, so called relational adjectives actually so whenever you have adjectives that are that work at high level of modification, they follow the formal gender. Of course, it makes sense if gender is uh, interpretable. And actually, uh, when you switch gender, then you then you're talking about the properties of the individual. Um, and um, very briefly, note that mixed agreement is actually compatible not just with. Uh, um, uh, mm, nouns in the year, but also in nouns from uh, also with neuter nouns and also with um, nouns with third declension and maybe for, uh, first declension in 14. Um, I will not look at these, at, the, at these nouns very much in detail, but they're very interesting because uh, uh, they behave differently from those nouns for which mixed agreement is studied in close to detail. Okay. Uh, and now we go back. Remember I asked the question, is it the case that gender determines the declension class or the declension class determines the gender or does it go in both directions? So it turns out that in fact, uh, again, in code switching, uh, you can show that uh, gender can determine declension class. And that's in an example 15. It's not, but this is not the only such example. But what happens there is here. It's, Code switch example from a, I think it's, it's, it's an American Russian speaker, so um, um, heritage language. Okay, so you want the word dog, you don't remember it in the matrix language. So you use the English word dog, okay? But because you have some vague feeling that dogs in Russian are feminine, you assign the gender feminine to the word dog, but it doesn't have the right declension class. So what do you do? You put it in the, in the suitable. And that's what happens with borrowings. So if you look at uh, low words, if you look at uh, nouns like nymphietka, starletka, katletka, right? In all these uh, nouns, I mean, if you look at the source language, they end in the consonant, at least all the way. But because this, they, they're strongly associated with feminine gender, they all become First declension class. Completely irrespective of the uh, So uh, it seems that the process goes in both directions in, in some way. Uh, so a noun, as we see it now, can be specified for any combination of the folds. It can be specified for declension class. It can be specified for grammatical gender. What do I mean? Well, for Russian, it's not very obvious. But if you look at German, well, you know, German doesn't have declension classes, but it still has, nouns have gender. And this gender doesn't seem to be determined by the lexical semantics of a noun. So let's call this grammatical gender for now, right? Because the obvious reduction would be to say, well, German actually has declension classes. They're just not operable uh, at the morphological level. And then we have lexical semantic gender, which is natural gender for humans and semantic analogy for others. 
And ideally, all three match. At least all two is as often two. But of course, there are uh, cases, lots of cases, where they do not match. And it's very interesting what's, what's happening there. So uh, what I'm going to do next is try to show to you that in, a, in some ways, in some ways, English will be, oh, English, Russian is very much like German and French. So how do you, try, how do you figure out what, what gender is? Well, you try and get away from the declension class. We already tried to do that with uh, indeclinable proper names, but indeclinable proper names, you know, proper names are difficult. Uh, not everybody will agree that they're nouns, like nouns in the marble way, especially, uh, well, yeah. If, you, if you're me, you will, uh, not everybody will. So let's look at just indeclinable nouns in Russian. Uh, so since in Russian, since they don't have a declension, so the declension classes, the gender can be only specified, pre-specified. You have to, when you work with them, you have, the gender has to come from somewhere. And it turns out that for the majority of cases, the gender assignment is completely semantic. So uh, in any one indeclinable nouns, I mean, this is the default. Okay? Um, however, you can have feminine and masculine indeclinable nouns. And then it's very much, it's, it's systematically lexical now, uh, semantic analogy. So is masculine because wind is masculine. And kohlrabi is, ma is feminine because cabin is feminine. And it, I, I don't know, when, when you read different grammars of indeclinable nouns, they all go, oh, okay, and this is feminine because it is assimilated to that feminine noun. It behaves like, um, I think it's called uh, hyperidine? Yeah. Hyper yeah, right, so the, the, bigger, the bigger category. Okay. So this virtually tells you you have to have interpretable gender. Um, and what you see next is that this interpretable gender is not just the feature gender, like the feminine and masculine mood, because uh, all of these feminine and masculine mood are, um, markers have an additional interpretation. So we have seen that neuter is an animate. It's very clear for all of Russian that neuter is an animate and the animate is neuter, and there's exceptions in both directions. Um, animate and declinable nouns are for the most part uh, masculine. Okay, so this is this is why I was trying to say that the masculine feature is marked. So when you have some certain forms of markedness, you get into the masculine gender, and animacy is one of them. Yet exceptionally, uh, animate and declinable nouns can be feminine. Once again, you very clearly see that they are. Uh, Feminine because of semantics. So, for instance, the tete fly is feminine because uh, the word fly is feminine. Um, there are some animate and declinable nouns, like I said, to agree according to the initial gender of the reference. So, chimpanzees are seen apparently feminine or masculine, depending on whether you're talking about the male or female chimpanzee. To the best of my knowledge, there are no animate neuter and declinable nouns. So, hmm? uh, it's 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 when people use that, I mean, I, I, I actually looked at this. When people use that, they use it in the nominative, in the accusative, sometimes in the genitive, and then it's dita. Mm -hmm. And when they're trying to do instrumental, it invariably goes to dito. Okay. So it's it's declined. It's weirdly declinable. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So for indeclinable nouns, Russian is Russian is term. Um, for declinable nouns. Um, uh, the declension class you, in declinable inanimate nouns, the declension class generally determines the gender. 
So in 17, you have the normal rules of gender assignments uh, for Russian. Uh, if it is declension class, it's a year declension class for masculine, the R declension class and uh, the uh, Yerik declension class are feminine, and um, the old declension class is inanimate. All this is, this is for better. This is in, it's in every grammar. It's, everybody knows that. Um, however, the fact that there are two minor declension classes, so the third declension class and the zero declension class, like those 10 nouns in Mia, this show, shows that you cannot just derive the declension class from gender. You cannot just say feminine is R. Or you cannot just say neuter is O. It just doesn't work. You need both. Uh, however, what's, what was new to me when I really started working on this is that there are systematic, there's a class of systematic exceptions to this, to this rule. So there are uh, situations where uh, there's several diminutive and augmentative suffixes that preserve the gender of the noun they combine it with, but change its declension class. And that's an empty. This is very unexpected. Right? But I think um, it's slightly, slightly more complicated than that because the diminutive suffix could also can change the declension class from, so if you have a third declension now, it will go into the uh, first declension now. But these do it very systematically uh, in very interesting ways. And I hope we'll have the time to return to this. Uh, because the declension class is not, the resulting declension class is not systematic. The resulting declension class depends on the gender of the source and the MPNMC of the source. Okay? So uh, for major declension classes, you can sort of try to assume that you start from the underlying gender specifications and you pass over to declension classes. And, uh, um, but you also need the declension classes independent of uh, gender. Um, okay, um, I'm really running out of time. Uh, uh, you are not. Uh, you have uh, 10 minutes for the lecture and then uh, 15 minutes uh, for the discussion. So, uh, 25 minutes for the talk. Okay, so talk. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best to at least give you some finished impression of the so we go to uh, animal declinable nouns. For those, you can uh, very easily show that uh, they're generally, uh, uh, also, the gender is also generally determined by the declension class. Uh, what they do show, which is something that is interesting, is that neuter cannot be treated as the absence of a feature in Russia. Why? Because if you look at um, in declinable nouns, then you see that uh, animacy contributes a feature that creates a masculine noun. But with declinable nouns, it's not good enough. Because, so you need some feature to be assigned from the declension class that would block the assignment of masculine for animate, na animate neuter nouns such as nasikova and insect. Right? So from the point of view of the declension class, the uh, neuter, from the point of view of their animacy, they must be masculine. In order for them to not become masculine, you need to have some feature blocking the assignment of the feature masculine, feature marked, which are uh, There are systematic exceptions again to the system. Um, so the gender assignment rules are, are as in 17, no difference. There are again the same systematic exceptions with diminutive and augmentative suffixes. And there's a couple of lexical exceptions that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are more. I know of Koala, which is masculine, despite the fact that it belongs to the Arctic Lantern class, and I also know of Zarika. Not, not in uh, the, uh, when we're talking about Ala um, Pugachova, uh, but uh, uh, in the animal sense. Okay, so uh, there too you sort of need some uh, gender specification coming from the lexicon that is that is not from the lexicon, coming from the noun itself. Okay? I don't want to say lexicon because it's not a problem. If you if you're distributed morphology, there's basically two sorts, two sources from where you can draw now. Finally, for human declinable nouns, there's generally a match between the lexical semantics and the formal gender. So if you have a human noun that denotes uh, a female, it will be feminine. If it denotes a male, it's uh, masculine. Again, there are systematic exceptions. Um, 
uh, one of them, the winner of are the um, first, sorry, second declension class keratotypes. So what it seems like Mizok and Mashkin uh, diminutive, right? Uh, which can trigger masculine diminutive. So you can actually, you can say that Mizok threshold, где наш Mizok, not for everybody, but uh, there are dialects that do that, you know, idealists that do that. Um, and again, for human declinable nouns, you can, as I said, you can switch gender, and then you have the class of common gender nouns. Uh, right, so there's three cases that I'm um, aware of where the surface gender and the declension class gender do not match. The first one is the so called common gender nouns. Those are usually discussed at length, uh, and there the agreement goes by. Uh, the natural gender of the referent, uh, both MP internally and MP externally. Then there are hybrid nouns, and these are nouns like brach, prefiesa, and so on and so forth, which allow mixed agreement, so you can say nasha, brach, nasha, prefiesa, by the natural gender of the referent, but it's only possible in the nominative case. It can be, it's possible MP internally and MP externally, but it's uh, only possible in the nominative and then there's a third class, which is usually not this class, and these are style nouns, type of address nouns, like vaše uh, vysočstvo, vaše milost, which can trigger masculine agreement on the phrase. Never any MP internal or mixed agreement for these nouns. Um, right. So, um, common gender nouns are, have been looked at, and people um, suggest different things for them. So for one thing, you can have a separate common gender for these nouns. But the Omgen shows that um, these nouns are actually divided into two subclasses. And these are examples 19 and 20. So there's a class of nouns that are expressive epithets, like zanuda, shliapa, skatina. Uh, which, uh, when we don't have a specific reference in mind, they agree as feminine. And then there's the class of profession nouns, which are the opposite. When we don't have a special reference in mind, then they agree as masculine. Stars, there is one, sudia in some dialects, is another. And um, then you can formalize this. To, so you cannot just say it's common gender nouns. There's two subclasses. And somehow you need to encode the fact that one subclass is by default masculine and the other subclass is by default feminine. So what's going on here is intuitively that the declension class of these nouns assigns them to one gender and their lexical semantics, because they're animate, assigns them to another gender. And this is why I think maybe there's a the possibility for the lexical, the um, semantic gender, not the natural gender, but the semantic gender of such nouns to also come into play, in the sense that you can say that professional nouns are specified by the lexical semantics as masculine, presumably because we're uh, not as politically correct as we want to be, and we still think that uh, most professions are uh, uh, dominated by males. And expressive epithets are probably marked as minor feminine, probably because we still think that women are uh, bad things. Um, along with fire, I suppose. Um, okay, but um, the way the way I'm going to do that, I'm not going. To, I'm not going to have the time to discuss how I'm going to do this. I'm just going to try and uh, show to you what class of problems I'm trying to solve. Uh, so, um, what we need is, in a sense, for these nouns, is on the one hand, there's this lexical semantic core to these nouns, right? So, expressive epithets are in one category, professions are in the other category, and it's systematic. So, this is semantically assigned gender. That's one thing. The other hand, we have also gender assignment by the natural gender. So, if we are referring to a uh, uh, feminine, a female boar, it will be uh, agreeing as a feminine, and if we are referring to a male boar, it will be agreeing as a masculine. Um, so we need a mechanism that can handle all of these facts. And also, right, take into consideration the declension class. Why? Because hybrid nouns, and that's uh, now on page 10, 3, 
3.4.2. Those nouns do not behave like common gender nouns, we know this, uh, because well, they show mixed agreement, they only do so in um, uh, nominative case positions. And the intuition that I want to pursue is this is because they, they sort of case deficient, deficient in the sense that uh, Yasha Testelitz proposes in his paper on case deficient uh, elements. And why this is so, again, I won't have the time to discuss this, but there's some indications later in the handout. Um, so what I want, to, uh, basically what I want to say is that the reason why they, are, they behave the way they behave is because they are introduced in a syntactic structure that is similar to the syntactic structure of closed acquisitions, which is what my second half of my handout is dedicated to it, which I'm not doing here. Okay, um, so I, I'm afraid I have to um, um, stop here and just try to summarize what I have managed to say. Um, so what I hope to have shown is that in order to discuss five features, you need a syntactic mechanism that assigns five features on the basis of the lexical semantic property and formal properties of the noun itself. And that these five features are systematically interpretable even for the case of gender, which has usually been assumed, at least for an animate noun, to very often be a formal feature. Um, the framework in which this uh, goal is most easily achieved that I know of is this, the distributed morphology framework where um, uh, let what we look at as what we consider to be a word is actually can actually be a complex syntactic structure introduced as such or and stored as such and uh, the actual mechanism that I want to develop to handle these cases especially the cases of mixed agreement uh, is provided by um, um, the close acquisition construction, exemplified, for instance, in 25, where if you look carefully, uh, what happens, I'm sorry I can't get into it, uh, what you can see is that uh, the case agreement patterns within that uh, closed acquisition construction strongly depend on the lexical semantic class and on the gender match or mismatch between the classifying noun, the sort of, um, and the, um, the proper name. So for instance, if you look at 26, now we see if Tuman Ke is okay because there's a gender congruence between the word street and the word Yuchimanka, but now it's about Chugye, Balchugye, is not good because Balchug is masculine. And um, basically, when you look at the um, entire pattern, what you see is that there's five different lexical semantic classes uh, where gender agreement, the necessity of gender congruence is different. And if you apply what you have learned from these classes to the assignment of gender, um, um, on the basis of natural gender, then I think, this, the way I try to develop this, I think it's still, I still think it works, uh, then you can get the distribution of um, uh, mixed agreement uh, for all the classes that I was interested in. I'm sorry, I, was, uh, <laughs> I didn't manage to tell you all this. Thing. Thank you. Uh, we have some uh, 12 minutes for a uh, uh, discussion. The floor is open. The first question is uh, by Jens and Peter. Please. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation with a, a, lot, a lot of interesting details. Um, so there are many things. I, I've been working on this problem myself a lot, so uh, there are many things I would like to, to discuss with you. But I think I'll, I'll stick to a general question. Uh, from a functional view that I've tried to adopt, uh, uh, taking the uh, structure seriously as well, but also considering that uh, language is formed form by usage. It, the, the distinction between syntactic and lexical, uh, or syntactical or lexically uh, uh, based assignment appears somehow artificial. When you you, uh, you you argue that uh, 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 gender assignment is basically uh, a syntactic, but uh, as I listen to you, I hear um, 
uh, I, I, again, uh, you're talking about, uh, about semantic features in a way. Uh, so um, it, it may be a, a question of uh, terminology. But uh, uh, I, I agree with you that there's only one assignment system as such. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and the, for, for example, Colquitt's distinction between syntactic and semantic assignment, it doesn't really make sense. Because he, he, he describes them as two different systems. And how do they interact? They must interact somehow. And my point of view is that there is a, as you said, a default assignment, which is basically, uh, which is, is largely based on dimension. And then you have a number of, of additional rules, semantical based additional rules that all overrule the default assignment. But only if, if there's no such uh, rule in operation that the, 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 the gender will depend on the dimension. That's why you see typical it, it will inanimate if I go now. Uh, right. So I think on the major point, I think we're totally in agreement. There's mm. only one gender assignment system. Yes. Um, and when I talk about lexical gender assignment, it's only in descriptive terms. Uh, on the um, empirical um, uh, side, I'm not sure that I agree with you when you say that these additional semantic rules necessarily always override the formal rules. The reason why dubious is two is twofold. So on the one hand, uh, we have those mixed agreement cases where sometimes the natural gender does override and sometimes it doesn't. So for instance, okay, basic, very, very basic case, with Vrach, you can have mixed agreement, but with Uchitere, it just doesn't happen. Mm. Because of how Uchitere is. But in a, in a way, right? Right, right. so natural cheating doesn't work. Right. Okay, so while there is a rule that for says male denoting nouns are male, uh, masculine and female denoting nouns are feminine, there is uh, It doesn't always override. The same thing with um, semantic assignment rules with um, indeclinables in other systems. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's not always the case that when you have a category, then it always overrides. It just doesn't happen. So, I don't know, uh, a baboon is masculine, even though for indeclinables you have the semantic rule that says apes are feminine. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and secondly, the reason is second reason is different declension classes behave differently with respect to that uh, those semantic uh, gender assignment rules. So it's not the case that they will just override. It, it's really a complex system. That's that, and that is why I'm what I was I was I haven't finished to describe what I'm trying to do. But what I'm trying to do is uh, to have a complex syntactic structure where you require gender congruence, which can be achieved in a number of ways. The, um, yeah. Not agreement, congruence. The, um, I think that the whole deposition structure will allow you to do that. It's too complicated to explain the five well, yes. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Thank you, Ora. I've got a very, a very brief but important remark here keeping telling us that German doesn't have declension classes, but then because that's wrong. German does have. But plenty of them. Right, well, okay, so, sorry about that. Yeah, no, I didn't. Then I think you're talking about French. <laughs> no, it's, you're totally right. It says that, yes, there are groups of... Further questions? <laughs> uh, But uh, I think this, maybe, maybe, I think 
this data come from um, Cosette, and I think he was relying on the um, work that was done by Graudina and others. Okay. And that was in the 70s, and since then it's become, even they, they noted that it was becoming more and more uh, used. женским родом этой ситуации, когда учительница не подходит, ну, второе значение слова да. учитель, возвышенная да. это, она, да. она наш учитель, да. и вот, да. наша учитель. Я, я бы не сказал наша учитель, я бы не сказал, я а то представить себе людей, которые... Это вы как сказали, она наша учительница, в смысле, возвышенная. Нет, Stein talks about uh, such examples, basically about the fact that in some that even in scenarios where you actually have a uh, feminine counterpart, like Uchiti, 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 there are scenarios where the, fem the feminine counterpart cannot be used. So like for instance, Kudoshnik in the sense of painter, yes. In the sense of artist, Kudoshnik Slova, Kudoshnitsa Slova just doesn't work. I would say that it's possible to date uh, a lady poet, uh, but well, uh, a man of status is a quiet about Fuentes as well. I'm sorry. Uh, questions? Uh, we still have. Uh, Time for us. We still have some three minutes uh, for questions. Yeah. Um, uh, complete tone switching. Um, in the beginning, uh, you said that you were not aware of of, of languages with with two different gender uh, gender systems. Um, such as non class versus national gender or something of this kind. Um, I'm not sure this is precisely the case uh, in the loop, but uh, only it, uh, it could be uh, one, of, one, one, one of possible possible candidates for this uh, for this uh, this kind of system is uh, Neon, a popular language described by Sebastian Hedden, which has uh, at least uh, two subsystems which are operative and in agreement and they, they are distinct from each other. Uh, I'm not sure this is what you're looking for, but this probably something which approaches this. I'll uh, give the reference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. <coughs> well, actually, uh, uh, so, somehow I missed that remark as it being like in here. But if you're looking for uh, a language with Two gender systems, you don't have to move very far away because Russian is such a language, that's all I, I, I can see. Uh, there are two, two gender systems, uh, the traditional Indo European gender, masculine, uh, feminine in user, and animus versus inanimous. Because genders are noun classifications that trigger agreement. So they are both, and are they in, somehow interact in Russian? I don't I, 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 Syntactic. In, I mean, we don't agree that there's that there's a distinction, but in the traditional trend. Uh, well, uh, I have a question about uh, code switching and uh, uh, wrong guessing about uh, genders. So, um, what about Spanish? Uh, if I switch uh, Spanish and want to uh, 